بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد الحمد لله A warm welcome to all our dear guests and all our dear brothers and sisters welcome to our amazing exciting program tonight the theme of tonight's discussion is surrounding the miraculous hijrah the migration of our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam i'll be mc for tonight inshallah and as usual we like to begin all our programs and all our events with a beautiful recitation of the holy quran and tonight alhamdulillah as you can see we have a very esteemed lineup of guests and speakers mashallah so alhamdulillah we are very blessed for their presence tonight uh, our opening recitation is going to be by our dear brother Hafiz Muhammad Sezgin, who was born in Melbourne, Australia. He completed his hives at the age of nine. He has led prayers and recited Quran at various mosques all around the world. He was invited to recite at different countries, including Germany, Belgium, Holland, and even France. He has completed the Faculty of Theology, majoring in International Theology at Marmara University, Turkey. He is currently the Secretary of Keysborough Turkish Islamic and Cultural Center and the Head of Religious Affairs at Mount Hira College, located in Keysborough, Victoria. Without further ado, Hajam, over to you, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة أم 
Inshallah, my dear brothers and dear sisters, let us get this program on the road, inshallah. And uh, we will start with our first speaker for the night, inshallah. Uh, our esteemed guest is Sheikh Khalil Rahman Hamid. His topic is going to be about the atrocities in Mecca which triggered the Prophet's migration. Now, I know Sheikh Khalil does not need any introduction, for we do know him, but inshallah, for the benefits of our viewers online and uh, for our guests who are new here, inshallah, we will mention a few things about Sheikh Khalil. So, Sheikh Khalil is the Imam and President of IYAKA, which stands for the Islamic Education and Awareness of KC Association. He's the Vice President of the Board of Imams Victoria and the Executive Member of the Australian National Imams Council. And mashallah, we've had the Sheikh in our presence in this area for a while now, mashallah. We've been blessed by his presence here before. And inshallah, we hope to learn and benefit from him tonight. Uh, without further ado, Sheikh Khalil. Alhamdulillah. 
الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ يمكر بك الذين كفروا ليثبتوك أو يقتلوك أو يخرجوك ويمكرون ويمكر الله والله خير الماكرين uh, Dear respected brothers, sisters and mashayikh Alhamdulillah <coughs> we have gathered here and we should be thankful first and foremost to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have given us this ability to come here. And secondly, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that man la yashkurin nas la yashkurillah, that the one who doesn't think the makhluq, they will not be able to think the khaliq. And that is why we are very grateful and thankful to Al-Itqan and <coughs> the founder of Al-Itqan, Shaykh Dawood and his team for arranging and making this beautiful program of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That perfume, the atr of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So remembering those moments of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the message to deliver this, deliver this to the humanity. And then he faced the challenges and difficulties. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him successful and gave him his nusrah. And that is why we are here. Otherwise, if it was not for his sacrifices and his companion's sacrifices, we would not have been here in this land, in this country, in this time of the fitna, in the weekend, sitting over here and listening to the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we should be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us among this ummah, the ummah of the khair, that always they are walking on the journey of the khair. Inshallah, my topic <coughs> is about the atrocities of the people of the Makkah that they brought upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companion and then that triggered that to the journey of the Hijrah from Makkah to Medina. Now every one of us we know <coughs> that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while delivering his message when he received it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he faced challenges, he faced difficulties, and he came across those moments that were unbearable. And <coughs> he tried his best in order not to leave his country, his place of birth, and especially the Kaaba, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned when for the last time that he looked to the Kaaba and said that you are the best place on the face of the earth. And you are the best place and the most beloved place to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it was not because of the people that expelled me from this city, I would have never, never come out of this city. But that was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to make another place such as Medina to welcome Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of us, we know that how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faced these challenges. When he delivered the message, so you know brothers and sisters that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told that you are a majnoon, you are someone that making the stories fairy tales and all the stories coming down from forefathers and there is no meaning for these. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept continuously 
delivering the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time facing the challenges and the difficult moments in his life. But alhamdulillah in his life he had some people, especially his wife Khadija radiallahu anha and his uncle Abu Talib <coughs> that they supported him. And now this is very important for us to know that when a member of the family in the job of the da'wah is helping you, you are the best person because you don't have to worry about your household. Because when you go from the hardship of the community into your household, someone is welcoming you. And you don't feel that you are in the middle of nowhere that what you are doing. So that is why the best place that someone can get rest and then recharge himself is his house in order to continue his da'wah. So Khadija radiallahu anha was there for that. And that is why from the start of the da'wah that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq that read in the name of your Lord that who has created and from that moment that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt the heaviness of this da'wah, he straight away went to Khadija radiallahu anha. And over there he found his comfort. And that is why Khadija radiallahu anha took, her, took him to <coughs> his uncle over there. And then he showed him the way, what to do. And on the journey, then Abu Talib came out after difficulties and he stood up for him. But once they left this dunya, staying in the Mecca was very difficult. Why? Because there was no more support from the house and from the community. And that is why the hijrah became fard upon him in order to leave Mecca and to go to Medina. And during his journey <coughs> in the Mecca, so we know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he delivered the message. And the ayat revealed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he gathered the people and told them, if I tell you that behind this mountain there is enemy and then they will attack you, do you believe me? They said yes, because during these four years of your life amongst us, we have never experienced any falsehood from you. And that is why we believe you whatever you say. Then he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that I am the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in me. And there started the enormity, there started the challenges, and they said that tabbat yada, tabbat lak, that be <coughs> destroyed and be ruined for this purpose you have gathered us. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, tabbat yada abi lahab, be destroyed and be ruined the life in the hands of Abu Lahab for what he said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these kind of challenges, his ashab, the sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in, from the youngest to the oldest, they were subjected to atrocities and subjected to <coughs> executions. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to pass in witnessing the adab and the punishment that the kuffar of the Quraysh were bringing upon his ashab, he said, Sabran ya ahla yasir, that make patience ya family of the yasir, and our meeting is in the Jannah, insha'Allah. So that encouragement of the Jannah met the execution of the punishment of the Quraysh easy upon the Sahaba, Rizwanullahi alayhi majma'in. Remember, their brothers and their sisters, Bilal radiallahu anhu, that he was punished and executed by the kuffar of the Quraysh in the desert, that they put a big stone on his chest in order to make him to return from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Ahad, Ahad, that only one Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only one. Now remember, their brothers and their sisters, those sahaba in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were not sitting under the air condition in the hot weather or in the, the heated room in the winter. They were where there was no food, no water. At the top of that, there was those challenges that they were facing delivering the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember their brothers and their sisters 
that this message, Alhamdulillah, today we have and we close our eyes and we see that how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to walk in the Mecca inside the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how his enemies, they, 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 they brought those dirts and things upon him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while he making sujood. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to deliver this message to the humanity that today, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was facing challenges, his ummah tomorrow will live in a comfortable life. And that is why, dear brothers and dear sisters, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he accepted all these challenges and faced all these challenges. And he let some of the Sahaba to leave the Mecca because the job of an Amir, the job of a leader, is to protect the life of his followers. He, the job of the leader is not to, to send forth his followers to the destruction. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when things became difficult on him, on his ashab, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent some of his ashab to Habash in Yunu, and then afterwards to Medina. And then at last he himself left with Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. Now, dear brothers and dear sisters, these reasons that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca. How many? <coughs> so these moments that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca, dear brothers and dear sisters, those moments are not comparable to any moments that any human being faces any difficulty. And that is why... It is very important for us to read the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to think upon those moments that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to live with his ashab in the shu'ab of Mecca where every kind of anything that a human being think about was not possible for a human being to live over there. And that is why the hijrah became first. And the last and the, at the top of them was that they plotted to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because they were fearing that this message once gets out of Mecca, that's it. That is the end of Kufr, that is the end of the atrocities of the Quraysh. And they were very well prepared for that to do that. And that is why in Dar al-Nadwa, they said, and they made mashwara, what should we do? They said there is only one way in order to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they say, that to distribute the blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon the Qabail in the tribes of the Quraysh in Mecca. So no one can be found guilty of being taking revenge from that. So that is why when they gathered over there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to leave the, Ka'ab, uh, to the Mecca to the Medina. But before leaving, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ali radiyallahu anhu to sleep in his, play, in his bed. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angel to protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his protectors, his army, in order to, to protect Ali radiyallahu anhu and to protect, protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set forth for the journey of Medina with Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this journey, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُ بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُخْرِجُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ That when the kuffar of the Mecca, they started plotting against you, either to kill you or to remain you in Mecca, not doing any haraka, not doing any da'wah, or to expel you without anything that you can do, and where they plotted plots, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best planner. So that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set forth for the journey of Medina. Now, the second reason that Medina was the most possible place that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have gone over there with his ashab in order to establish a state where Muslims are free to practice their religion. And that was that is comes in today's context for us, dear brothers and dear sisters, and there are lots of 
questions um, in the community overseas and here that whether our stay here in this country is allowed for us to live in order in this country where it is not ruled by the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why where a Muslim is able to practice his deen, so that is the best place for him in order to live. Remember that the time that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he migrated from Mecca to Medina. Medina was not an Islamic state. Medina was somewhere that there was other people ruling in Medina. So that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose Medina because there was a possible environment in order to spread the message of the deen. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Medina. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Medina. But in this context, inshallah, before my time ends, so we need to understand their brothers and their sisters that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after coming to Medina, he said, La hijrata ba'd al fat There is no hijra after the fatah. So no, no hijra, because there is no purpose for the hijra. And that is in the context that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Now hijra can be for many purposes. One of them is the practicing of the deen. It could be economically, it could be socially for someone that who is not able to live in an environment, he can leave that place and live somewhere that he feels comfortable. So that is why. But in the context that we live in this country, dear brothers and dear sisters, remember that we live in a time, in a place that is full of fitna. But how can we minimize this fitna? Is by leaving the sins. And that is why when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a better place in order to do his da'wah. Today, if we leave a work that is not suitable for our religion and for ourselves, tomorrow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide us something better than what we are doing today in haram. And if we are doing something that a place that we are living there is full of fitna and we move closer to the masjid and to a community center, Islamic community center, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide us the best thing in that area for us because the hijrah always brings khair in the life of the people. There is no hijrah that it doesn't bring any khair. Even if you move from one place in order to go somewhere that you feel more comfortable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you better than what you have left behind. Why? Because it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why I will end by the saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the context of the hijrah that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says man taraka shay'an lillahi awwazahu allahu khayran minhu that anyone who leaves behind something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide him something better than that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq and the understanding Alhamdulillah, I can see lots of Alhamdulillah, our beautiful youngsters over here, that these are the hope of us, dear brothers and dear sisters in this country, that we can leave behind and they will carry this journey of the khair, insha'Allah. Wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala ala khayri khalqi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Jazakum Allah khair, Shaykh Khalil, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for that very inspiring reminder an introduction to the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Our second speaker is Brother Fadil, but looks like he's not here today, so we'll move on to the next one. Allah. Inshallah, I have a very short one, Sheikh, so I can stand here. Allah. Is that okay? So apparently I've been forced in this position to just let you guys know. Yeah? Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, may Allah SWT bless you all. Jazakumullah khair. Look, brothers, alhamdulillah. Um, of course, one thing about the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the miraculous journey from Mecca to Medina, one thing about this story, this story is that you don't have a full version. There's so many different narrations that have been put together, right? And uh, there's so many variations and different details, and subhanAllah, if we were to go to those details, we probably won't do you any justice tonight. So, I'm just going to highlight just the uh, a few parts 
uh, and probably I won't quote any of the text, just in the interest of time, uh, just regarding the moments before the hijrah, and uh, and maybe one one incident on just before on on that uh, in the beginning of that hijrah. So, Subhanallah, the situation in Mecca was getting dangerous, and as Sheikh Khalil reminded us in Darun Nadwa, they were already plotting. And we know that in the details, they were like, what should we do? Should we, uh, you know, just kick him out of the city or what should we do? And it, all these plots and plans came and they finally landed on the plot of Abu Jahl, which he knew and he was saying, look, I'm just going to say what everyone else wants to say. And that is the only way we're going to stop Muhammad is for us to kill him. Oh, this is the time here? Can the sisters hear now, inshallah? Oh, maybe we haven't... Uh the switch over yet. Subhanallah khair inshallah. So they finally came down to the decision. There's only one way we're going to stop this man and his mission, and that is we have to kill him. And they said, but the thing is, we can't just send one person. Otherwise, the, t the, the blood money and the retaliation will be too big for us. Why don't we pick one person from every tribe? Pick one person from every tribe and they all go together and they all go to commit that crime so that there's too much blood on their hands and all we need to do is just pay the blood money and that's it. So this was what they agreed upon and that was it. This plan was done in secret among them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Jibreel alayhi salam to send down and to let the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know what has transpired. At that moment, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went and in the narration, this was during the hottest time of the day. The hottest time of the day in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the hot climate, most people you will see are just under the shade, indoors, taking a rest. Because it is just too hot to do anything else. So if anyone was to be outside during this time, this time where it's the Kailula, right? The Kailula time, the resting time during the midday. Anyone that's out that time must be either very urgent or very, very important that it can't wait. And so they saw in the distance, they saw a man coming, approaching the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And this man was covered, his face was covered. And they, as, walk, as they got closer, they recognized it was the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And as he walked into the house, he asked for everyone to clear the house because this was now a very important issue, a very secret issue about to discuss. And so Abu Bakr said, everyone, is, has, and there's no one here except your family or, or, or Messenger of Allah. And then Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given me the command to migrate. It's now time for me to go. And then he said, oh Messenger of Allah, does that mean I'm going to be your companion on this journey? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes. And when he heard that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu started to cry out of joy and happiness. In fact, it was narrated that Aisha radiallahu anha stated that I never knew, I never knew a man could cry out of happiness. I never knew that could happen until I saw my father cry out of happiness hearing the news that he was going to accompany the Messenger of Allah sallallahu on this journey. SubhanAllah. And Abu Bakr, he sort of knew, you know, because he was, 
You know, and subhanAllah, one of the things that he did was he prepared from way back. He knew this journey was about to happen. And so he had already prepared two very fit camels. He'd been feeding them good, um, good nutrition, preparing them. Apparently in the desert, these camels, mashallah, subhanAllah, an amazing creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these camels, you have to... You know, because you know how they've got the, the they've got the internal storage. Yeah, they can keep water inside of them. That there, there's actually a technique. It actually takes time. Those who live in the desert know that apparently you have to give the camel salt. So when you give the camel salt, it gets thirsty, so it starts to drink, 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 and then because you want it to keep a big storage, so you got to keep feeding it, and this takes time, and then that's when the Second hump of the camel comes through this uh, story, subhanAllah. So, it takes, so you can tell this was a, a, a proof of the, the plan right, and the strategy of Abu Bakr in his, in his journey to migrate with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, from Mecca. And subhanAllah, that once the news came, they said, all right, we have to leave at night. Right? We have to leave at night. And the strategy was, we're g- you know, because obviously they know if they were to go on the normal road, the normal path that usually people take from Mecca to Medina, people are going to know wh- where they are. They're going to get caught out. They're going to get caught up and they'll get caught. So among the strategy that the, boss, that the, uh, the Prophet and Abu Bakr took was they went the opposite direction. Right, and this is the story where they w- reached the cave of Thor, Ghar Thor. Right, and this is the uh, the mountain which uh, they call Thor, which is a, a bull. If you look at it, the shape of the mountain looks like a, a bull that's uh, bowing down. And this is the opposite way, right? So this is where they went, and they hid in that cave for three days. Now the strategy was on the ground. The Prophet ﷺ left Ali radiallahu anhu in his place, right? Because he knew, and again, there's a few different narrations on how this happened. Some narrations say that the Prophet ﷺ left before the, the people that came to, to assassinate the, the messenger. Some narrations say he left before. Some narrations say that the people who came to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ had already come surrounded his house from all corners but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a miraculous thing where the Prophet ﷺ was able to walk in front of them and he, they weren't able to see some narrators say in, Ibn Ishaq narrates that he read the ayah from Surah Yasin وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدَّ وَمِنْ خَافِهِمْ سَدَّ فَأَكْشَيْنَاهُ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ so Allah placed a veil from behind in front of them so they couldn't see and that he threw dust in their face and they couldn't see. So subhanAllah, Prophet ﷺ was able to escape even though right in front of them. SubhanAllah. So then they went. The first strategy was Ali to be put in that place. And the reason why Ali was put in that place, I always thought about this, right? When I was younger, when I heard the story. And later on we find out the reason why Ali was put in the place of the Prophet ﷺ's bed. Why was he put there? Number one, because the people of Mecca, even though he was a prophet and even though he was a messenger of Allah, even though he was calling people, people still trusted him because he was still a Sadiq al Amin. And so people had so much stuff, so much belonging, that the Prophet was still looking after because he was the most trustworthy person. So he needed someone. To make sure that that stuff gets distributed before, they, before Ali leaves. Subhanallah. Amazing, right? Anyway, they go to Ghar Thawr, which is the opposite direction. And now the Meccans are going crazy, right? Some narrations say they even beat Ali radiallahu anhu up, try to get information out of him, then they let him go. Some say they even went to even the daughter of Abu Bakr, Asma, and they tried to torture her to get information out. They couldn't. Right? And by now they say, you know what? Let's put uh, uh, sh- uh, dead or alive, wanted. Yeah, There was a wanted bounty 
on the head of, Abu, of Muhammad sallallahu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the value of a hundred red camels. The equivalent today will probably be near, I don't know, maybe a hundred red Ferraris, right? Something massive. And so when this went out, lots of bounty hunters and hit men, they, got, they heard of this and boom, they started to look for him. One of those bounty hunters was Suraqah bin Malik. Now later on, he does become Muslim. That's later Sira. But Suraqah was so good, right? Imagine this. Suraqah was so good, he was the only one that was successful in locating exactly to what point he actually went all the way. In fact, some narrators say that he was so close that he was at a speaking distance. So the story goes... He was able to somehow miraculously trace the footsteps, even though they tried their hardest to, you know, to erase the footsteps. And then Suraka was just like, oh, he went this way. He wasn't fooled by any, you know, deception of the roads. He was then at a distance of an arrow. So, in other words, if he took his bow and arrow, he was at that distance. He would have been able to assassinate them. But when he tried, suddenly, suddenly, his horse, the front feet of his horse, sunk into the sand. And then he fell off. And he was shocked. This is the first time this happened. And then he tried to go closer. And then he got to um, a, a, a distance where you can hear them, right? Again, he tried again. And then he's... he's you know, the, the, his horse's feet sank and he fell off the horse again. And now they had this, uh, like a talisman, like a, like a little idol they used to ask, you know. And every time he would pray to this idol or ask this talisman whether he should continue, it kept giving him the, don't, you know, as in like, don't do it. You know, it was like, don't continue this mission, subhanAllah. What happened? Was that, was that the sign I should start finishing off? So... Subhanallah, at this moment, Suraqa realizes, man, whatever mission this man is on, nothing will stop it. And then he called out to the Messenger of Allah, Oh Messenger of Allah, Muhammad, it is, I, I'm Suraqa bin Malik, I'm here. I know, trust me, I'm not going to hurt you because I can't. He said, but I need some assurance that you're not going to hurt me. He says, don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. So he comes forward and says, look, can you please put it in writing that Suraqa is free. He's not going to be harmed by, by Muhammad Wasallam. Imagine that. He wanted it in writing. <laughs> you know? Subhanallah. This is how much they realized the truth and the haqq that the Messenger of Allah Wasallam and Abu Bakr had. Right? Subhanallah. This is such an amazing thing. And um, that's one of many, many instances. There was a few other people along the way that tried to assassinate. At the cave of Thawr, right, the Quraysh were able, they, they went all the way up to, they located right where the Prophet and Abu Bakr were hiding. And Abu Bakr at that moment said, man, he could see the feet of the Quraysh. He could see their feet. He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, if they just look at their feet, they will see us. They're going to see us. And the Prophet said an amazing statement. The same statement which was said to who? Right? Who is the other prophet? Where, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where the Prophet told uh, Abu Bakr, La tahzan, inna Allah ma'ana. Subhanallah. Don't worry, Allah is with us. Subhanallah. Another narration from here. And this is from Suraq bin Malik. Suraq was saying in, in, in a later narration, he saw Abu Bakr, it was like a, uh, he was like a crazy rider. Sometimes he was next to the Prophet, sometimes he was in front of the Prophet, sometimes he was behind the Prophet. And it's like, what, what's, what's going on? You know, why? And later on, Abu Bakr explained, he said, SubhanAllah, whenever I felt, whenever I feared there was danger near the Prophet, I would come there. If I felt the danger was going to be ahead, I would go ahead. If I felt the danger was behind, I'll go behind. Subhanallah. Wow. 
amazing, right? Can't imagine the 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 love that Abu Bakr radiallahu had for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in some narrations, and we don't know the authenticity, while they were in the cave, apparently that there was, you know, he was being stung, right? While in the cave, but he couldn't make a noise. He didn't want to disturb. The Prophet son was sleeping on his lap. Subhanallah, all of these things you just can't imagine, right? And these are events, like first hand events from the guys that were on that journey. And subhanallah, this is just one of so many miracles that happened. And I can't, you know, I'd love to continue, but I think uh, my time is up. And so we, what we can take from this, my dear brothers and sisters, is number one, whenever we want to embark on a journey towards pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we know that the hijrah has many lessons, more than just the migration from uh, one land to another, but to migrate from disobedience to the obedience of Allah, to the migration from disobedience, from, from no faith to having faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from migrating from away from our sins towards good deeds. This idea of migrating, this idea of when we want to embark to, to, to search for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the things, one of the key things to have that's always going to be so important is that good companion. That good, pious companionship. Choosing the right friends. Because when you have the right friends, not only will that journey be somewhat easier, but the lessons and the things that you will experience along the way to witness the miracles of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the nusrah, of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the help, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you, will be simply just amazing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all pious companions to have companions like Abu Bakr radiallahu an and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for all of us to become serious and steadfast on our own personal hijrah towards the obedience and love and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The next speaker doesn't need introduction. Is our esteemed principal Imam Sheikh Dawood Fahid Fadl Mashkura. Alhamdulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam, tasliman kathir wa ba'd. Alhamdulillah, I would like to thank uh, Hoja Qari Muhammad, mashallah, for such a beautiful and capturing uh, recitation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. And also thank our senior Imam. Uh, Imam Khalil, mashallah, for taking out your time from your busy schedule and coming here. We understand how busy you are, mashallah. May Allah reward you for all these advices, as well as my colleague, uh, Sheikh Fadil, mashallah. Uh, I think we have covered everything, so I think we can call it a night now. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you, and also Sheikh Majdi here next to me. Uh, my countryman and my good friend as well, mashallah, as well as our doctor, our senior imam here next to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless doctor and bless everyone, inshallah. And this shows the brotherhood. This shows that the imams are united. So all of, of people that go out and make stories that imams are not united, I think today you need to go bury out those rumors now. Alhamdulillah. And uh, we go, we visit each other and we exchange these visits alhamdulillah and we'll continue uh, to exchange these visits time and again inshallah because of time uh, as the mashaykh have said i'll just elude and elaborate on one point or two so we understand that the atrocities intensified in mecca now from the day the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam declared his messengerhood as we have heard from Imam Khalil, then the Quraysh declared war against him. Why that war? Because of something that was embedded in their hearts, and that was the love of their uh, polytheism, worshipping idols. 
And they did all this because of revering their ancestry uh, practices, culture. And today we see the same culture taking people. Cultural practices were the same reasons that destroyed the Meccans. Culture becomes important more than it's done in other people's minds, in other people's hearts. And that's, that is the danger. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدَنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا Allah speaks about them that whenever they were guided, whenever alayhi salam would tell them that no polytheism should be revered, do not turn to your idol that we have stalked in the Makkah, in the Kaaba, and you have distorted the original religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They said, no, no, don't tell us this. We found our forefathers and we shall continue to follow the footsteps of our forefathers. Our forefathers have done what they have done. But now it's time to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we hear our youth today have been called names when they're practicing religion. When they come home and they say, I want to grow my beard. No, no, you can't. When I want to follow sunnah, no, you can't. You have to understand that this is dangerous. And many Mashaikh says that every time one sunnah is buried and you see something else prevailing. So what we need to take home is to cement the faith and the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to shun away from things that diverted the makers. So idol worship was only to revive the ancestry uh, practices. Number two, they are not torturing him, alayhi salatu wasalam. The intestine that they're putting on him when he's praying at the haram. And when they are dragging Bilal bin Rabah. And they are now torturing the family of Yasir like we have heard from Imam. Yasir himself, his son Ammar and his wife Sumayyah. The first martyr of Islam, Sumayyah. And we congratulate and we salute our women today. That Islam does not distinguish between men and women. What the ayah says, لا يضيو عمل عامل منكم من ذكر أو أنثى بعضكم من بعض. Allah does not give merits based on your gender. Allah looks at your sacrifice. Sumaya, Islam has made such that the first person to gain martyrdom was a female. The hijra was supported by female, like the Mashaikh have said, when Abu Bakr radhiyallahu an consulted with his daughters. That Asma that helped and sent food to Ghar al Hira. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she was smacked, Sumayya was smacked while she was pregnant. Can you imagine? And then we see the Hijrah. Now, all these atrocities and persecutions are becoming unbearable. So, what does he do? Alayhi salatu was salam, in the 12th year of Hijrah, after He's meeting with the delegation of people that came from Medina. And the Medina people were lenient and soft people. They offered him a home. You can come over, we'll look after you. And the following year, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated. He said that Bayatul Aqaba Thani was attended by 500 people that signed the Pledge of Allegiance with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah reward Ansar. It is because of the Ansar that Sahaba found their presence in Medina. So I will just run through some lessons. Alayhi salatu was salam now dispatches his Sahaba. Then now migrate. You tried your first migration to Habasha. It did not work. We have found an alternative place. But he's not the first one to migrate. He's not the first one to migrate. He tells the Sahaba that you leave and I, your messenger, will be the last one to leave. Why? Because I want to demonstrate leadership skills. As a leader, I don't look in my best interest before my subordinates. I will ensure the safety of my people, people under me. Make sure that they are okay. And my safety comes second. Alayhi salatu wasalam says the delegation. And subhanAllah, here we see the sacrifices of Sahaba. Such as they 
Persian Sahabi Salman al-Farisi radiyallahu an, who came to Mecca as pauper, a pauper, bankrupt person, no money, but because he was, he was a very hard worker, he was one of the millionaires in Mecca. On the day of migration, he loaded 10 camels with everything that you needed, almost like 10 containers in our understanding today. And the Quraysh comes and tell, tells him that, look, forget about it. All these accumulations is from our land. You're not taking anything out of our economy. Leave everything and go by yourself. And he had a very beautiful garment on top of him. And they said, even the garment that you have, leave it behind. He looks and he says, look, take whatever you want. But I am migrating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He leaves everything behind. And he walks, he walks, literally walks from Mecca to Medina, 500 k's. What sacrifices have we made for deen? Wallah, we cannot wake up for Fajr today. We can go to work. We understand the value of money. We cannot go to masjid, not walking, mounted. Think about it. Think about it. He walked, literally walked, and he goes to Medina. And when the Prophet ﷺ meets him after his hijrah, he tells him, Rabbi al Abba Yahya, your transaction and your sacrifices, you have made it all. Your Jannah is waiting for you. Deen is based on sacrifice, not on comforts. We want, people worship Allah based on their moods. Based on convenience. No, no. Deen is not based on conveniency. You will see hijrah is all based on sacrifices. So lesson number one. Sacrifices of Sahaba. And then when he goes, leaves Ali radiallahu anhu. Another sacrifice of Ali. You know how old he was? Ali radiallahu anhu at this age. He took bay'ah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the age of 10. Alayhi salam. When the ayah revealed, he assembled all, all the Quraysh and the Banu Hashim. He was a Banu Hashim. And you know the story. They all rejected him and declined his, declined his message. And the only person that stood up from the midst was Ali. And he went and placed his hand in the hand of the Prophet Wasallam And he makes bayah at the age of 10. And they all turned against him. What a man are you, Muhammad, alayhi salatu was salam. You are imposing your religion on children. But that Ali, we see him now sacrificing at the age of 13. Today, where are the teenagers? Sitting behind Fortnite. Sitting behind GTA 5. Sitting behind FIFA for hours. I cannot bring my child to the masjid. He is too young. Here, Ali sacrifices his life for what? For this deen. And you can't bring our children to the circles of Quran. And when the child tomorrow grows up and he cannot make dua for you after your demise and you are wondering what went wrong. When the child cannot read Quran, then you want to wonder what happened. Think about it. These sacrifices should Stand as lesson in our lives. And another, another lesson that we need to take home with is the sacrifices of Abu Bakr and Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Out of all Sahaba, out of all Sahaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the privilege to, the, to Abu Bakr to accompany the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It was for this reason that he cried. He did not cry because he wanted to leave Mecca or he got bored of Mecca. He cried and shed a tears. Who am I to be given the privilege out of all my, my contemporaries that I'm the person to accompany the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on this journey? And not knowing that Jibra'il Alaihi had mentioned his name, then now go to Abu Bakr and travel with him. Look at the sacrifices of Abu Bakr when he comes to Gharu Thawr. Gharu Thawr, two and a half hours going up. We've been there, alhamdulillah. It's not an ibadah to go, but if you do happen to be there, go and visit. 3,000 steps. You know, we have 1,000 steps here, right? How many of us go there? 3,000 steps. And you know how old was the Prophet at that time? 53 years old. Abu Bakr, 51. Today we have youngsters, mashallah, we can't even walk one, one kilometers. 
as Michelle, there's one brother here. He does 10 kilometers every weekend, and he's looking for people. So put up your hands, inshallah, and he's going to give you green tea, inshallah. Now, the sacrifices of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, at that time when they arrived at this place, you have to understand, they came to this place. No one had ever visited. You know when you go there, the only route that you, saw, you see, the only pathway that you see was the same pathway that they walked. No any other pathways. So this place had never been discovered before. So you can imagine how uh, scary it was in the cave. Abu Bakr tells the Prophet Sallallahu they wait for me here for a moment. I'll go inside and clean it up. He tears, he rips off his garment, a portion, and he cleans the interior of the cave. And he says, now come. And he takes out spiders, worms, and this and all, all these things. He goes inside first. And he sits, he says, now you messenger of Allah, come in. And when he goes in, alayhi salatu Abu Bakr stretches his legs and he tells him that your blessed face is going to be on my lap. It's going to be on my lap. Why anything happens? If anything comes to sting, it, I should be the one taking the, taking the pain, not you. And subhan, the prediction of Abu Bakr happened. A scorpion, a poisonous scorpion came and, you know, staying him, subhanAllah. And we see the miracle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He takes his, takes his saliva, puts on the affected, uh, you know, place, and then he got healed. Now, another point of reflection. At this juncture, at this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an entire surah of Surah Al-Qasas. From the beginning to end, where Musa alayhi salam, his beginning, how his life went, the torture and tragedies against Pharaoh and all those things are mentioned. Why at this time? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to comfort the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that don't be afraid. These people can be as dangerous or shirud or how naive they are, how harsh they are. But Pharaoh tried the same. Musa alayhi salam was saved. Allah tells him that remember Musa, same thing that has happened to you. You are in the cave and they will come in search of you. They did the same thing to Musa alayhi salam when they plotted his assassination. And the men came to tell him, People are plotting your assassination, Musa. So we advise you, abandon this city. The same happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Surah Al-Qasas we find, وَقَالَ رَبِّ نَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah saved me from the oppressors. Here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was trying to flee and to escape from the oppressors and he goes to Madian. And then the same word was, was mentioned. نَجَوْتَ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Surah Al-Qasas. But at the, the end, this is where we should focus on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of Surah Al-Qasas, he's in the cave and Allah is telling him, إِنَّ الَّذِي فَرَضَ عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لَرَادُّكَ إِلَى مَعَاد The one that have revealed the Quran to you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will return you back to your biological land. You see, Musa went to Madian after 10 years, he came back. You shall come back to the city of Mecca, do not cry. City of Mecca is yours. And then he goes and then we have heard of the Suraqa and all those things. Inshallah, in conclusion from my end, from my side, the concept of Hijrah. The concept of Hijrah is something very important for us. It's important for us as fathers, as dads, as moms. It's important to us as students, as children. The Hijrah do not only look at it from a geographical point of view. No, no. Hijrah is on different parts. Ibn al-Hajar al-Asqalani, he says that Hijrah is in different categories. And some of them say it's Hijrah in six categories. Some say uh, it's in 10, some say in, it's in 14. And part of Hijrah, and the hadith that was cited in Sahih Muslim, لا هجرة بعد الفتح لكن, لكن الجهاد والنية okay. ولكن الجهاد والنية Muslim, so you cannot migrate from Mecca. Right? You can't migrate from Mecca because this, and this, is, this was a prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu Now Mecca, inshallah, there will be no kufr that will take place there. So if you find yourself to be in Mecca, there's no migration. But for people outside the zones, if you know that your Islam is compromised, 
then you have options. Don't go and put everyone in a spotlight. You're not happy with the regime or with the state. Make a move. Travel. But not, not everyone can migrate. I sometimes sit and discuss with you know, some youth and they say, oh, we need to make hijrah. Yeah, you need to make hijrah. Yes, I understand that. But you're allowed to pray in Australia. Okay? You're allowed to have your masajid. You're allowed to uh, practice your religion. Show me one Islamic country that you can migrate to and be a, you know, do whatever you want to do as a Muslim and practice 100% Islam. Show me one country. And I always ask a question. What effort have you made as an individual to make hijrah from your, from your bad habits? So many of bad habits that we have, and we're not making hijrah from those habits. But yet, we think, no, this is not conducive for our deen. If we really are serious of hijrah, let's start migrating from our sins and from our bad habits. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless one and all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their brothers and the sisters for uh, joining us tonight. Inshallah, we uh, wish to see many more faces and we wish to see you people, inshallah, many more times, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Dawood. What an inspiring way to give us such beautiful highlights of this beautiful story of the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our next speaker, uh, who was scheduled for tonight, unfortunately, was unable to make it, Sheikh Mustafa Salakibi. So he does send his apologies, and hopefully next time, inshallah, he should be able to join us. So inshallah, I'd like to move on to the next and our final speaker for the night, uh, our esteemed guest, uh, Sheikh Majidi Isa, who is uh, one of the imams from the Listerfield Masjid and currently a chaplain for the Navy. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and uh, bless us tonight, inshallah, with his inspirations. Jazakumullah khair. Fadl mashkura. Jazakumullah khair. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatim al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa habibina wa shafi'ina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا رب العالمين أما بعد respected my shaykh elders our honorable guests الحمد لله we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for affording us the opportunity again to gather and no better place to gather than a masjid or a musalla where the kalamullah is elevated and the remembrance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sunnah is implemented. So in this new hijri year, the anniversary of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's immigration to Medina, indeed a very special moment that evokes a long journey of tireless work to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity. The message of light. The message of mercy. The message of compassion. The message of solidarity and justice. During this occasion, we remember the incomparable dedication of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'een. The matchless sacrifices they offered, the pain that they had to endure, the tears that they had to shed of those devoted heroes who preferred to give up their homes, sacrifice their wealth, their comforts, their families, and everything but not the call and the message they were entrusted with. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or as soon as the news had reached or had spread, that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companion Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh had departed Mecca, 
crowds came flocking out of the city of Medina every morning, eagerly awaiting and expecting the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would come out each and every morning and they would stay until the heat became so unbearable and they had to retire back and return back to their homes. Day after day, this continued until one day they came out and they had already returned to their homes and a Jew on that day decided to climb onto the rooftop of one of the forts of Medina. And here he caught a glimpse of three travelers clad in white clothing making their way slowly towards the boundary and the city of Medina al Munawwara. He shouted at the top of his voice, O oh, you people of Arabia, here is the great man that you have been expecting and that you have been waiting for. All of the Muslims rushed out of their homes. Weapons in their hands in case they needed to fend. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They all rushed out to meet and welcome Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into the city of Medina al munawwara Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, the shouts of Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, resonated, resounded in Banu Amr bin Alauf. Serenity encompassed, developed around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and revelation was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالِحُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ظَهِيرُ Allah says, then verily Allah is the Mawla, Allah is the protector, Allah is the master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord, and Jibreel, and the righteous amongst the believers, and furthermore the angels are his helpers. Urwa ibn Zubair radiyallahu an said, they received the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they followed the pathway into the city of Medina, heading towards Yamin or the right. There the Banu Amr bin Auf hosted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat down and the Ansar who had not had the opportunity to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who had not seen him before they came to greet him and it said the sun became so severe that Abu Bakr radiallahu an he had to stand up and shade Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This event of course it was an enormous and unprecedented day in the city of Medina al munawwara The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then made his way towards Kuba and one of the chiefs of the Banu Amr bin Auf hosted him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent four days here. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. It was during this period that the foundation of Kuba Mosque was laid on the basis of taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La masjidun ussisa ala taqwa min awwal yawmin ahaqqu an taquma fihi. فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا والله يحب الطهرين. Certainly, the masjid founded on piety from the very very first day, from the very very outset, is more deserving that you should stand to offer salah in it. For in it there are men who love to purify themselves, and Allah subhanahu wa taala loves those who purify. Themselves. 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Friday morning he headed off to the, 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 the Banu al-Najjar. And the Banu al-Najjar they were his maternal uncles. And they had, he had sought them or reached out to them to come and os, escort him and Abu Bakr radiyallahu an. He rode towards the new headquarters amidst the beautiful greetings of the Badanese followers who had lined the streets of Medina. He halted at a place amongst the Banu Salim and there he performed Salatul Jumu'ah or the Friday prayer with a hundred followers. Meanwhile, the tribes and the families of Medina they came streaming forth and competed with one another in inviting the noble visitor to join them in their homes. The girls of Medina used to chant beautiful verses of poetry of welcome in, and rich in meanings of obedience and dutiful to the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Though not wealthy, Every Ansar was wholeheartedly eager and ready and anxious to receive the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his house. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam basically informed them that the camel he was upon is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wherever this camel will stop, that will be the abode of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The camel, of course, kneeled at a place belonging to two orphan boys, Suhail and Sahil. And these two boys were under the care of the guardianship of As'ad ibn Zurara. And at this place, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willing will make this new place our abode. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then invited these two orphans and told them to name a price for the area or the land. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had intention to purchase this land and establish a mosque there. The two boys then said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to give this unto you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refused to take it as a gift and he paid the price for what these boys were offering. So let us move fast forward for a while inshallah ta'ala because we've got... How many minutes left, ya You've given me 10 minutes? Saba? Khalas inshallah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had now settled in Medina and the, Med the Medina era can be, di be divided into three phases. The first phase is characterized by lots of trouble, discord, and too many obstacles from within occupied by hostile forces from without, aiming at trying to extinguish the message of Islam. The second phase featured a truce with the pagan leadership and ended in the conquest of Mecca in Ramadan, eight years after, after Hijrah. It also witnessed the Prophet wasalam, inviting kings beyond Arabia to enter the fold of Islam. And in the third phase, people came to embrace Islam in numbers. Tribes and other folks arrived in Medina to pay homage to Rasulullah and it ended with the death of Rasulullah in Medina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to deal with three distinctively different categories of people with different respective problems. First and foremost, his companions, the noble and Allah-fearing elite. Of course, the mushrikun, still detached from Islam and were purely from the tribes of Medina. And then there was also the Jews. Just to sum up, inshallah ta'ala, five Timeless lessons from the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Just because of time, I'm just going to name it so that we just can perspective. I wanted to elaborate, but unfortunately our time is up. 
next time inshallah ta'ala so lessons from the countless um, basically the, the lessons that we can learn of course are innumerable we can't count them but we will focus on five first and foremost foremostly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of us because there's a verse إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدَ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ ذُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ الصَّحْرِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا If we do not aid the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already aided him when those who believed had driven him out of Mecca as one of two when they were in the cave and he said to his companion, لَا تَحْزَنْ Do not grieve. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَةً Allah sent down the tranquility upon him and supported him with angels you did not see and made the words of those who believed of the lowest of words. And the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got elevated and was the highest and Allah is exalted in might and wise. The second lesson, trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of difficulty, Brings ease. Obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands even if it doesn't make sense. And with each difficulty, there comes ease. And what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam establish ultimately in the city of Medina al Munawwara? He established brotherhood. The example there we can use the story of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Perhaps all of you has, have heard about it, is an excellent example. So, most importantly, let us make our own hijrah from deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like towards the deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And also, we are living in a time where things are so chaotic. We need to hold on to our Iman. We need to hold on to our Taqwa. The earlier Muslims migrated physically in all meanings of the word. Today, we also witness a lot of Muslims migrating. Some succeed and some are struggling. There are many people throughout the world who continue to face severe hardship in their lands. They want to migrate from injustice, corruption and tyranny to justice. Tens and thousands are imprisoned and killed and so forth. It is a very hard and ruthless path and it may take many many years. Moreover it is very important to remember that the process of migration is the only start of another new and difficult route. Where after migration the migrants should show the entire world that the way of life that they carry is one suited for all times and all places. Therefore Come to the best work. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to heed the proper lessons from this blessed migration and to instill its rich meanings into our hearts and to answer our supplications and to make this occasion full of blessing. Make this an occasion a charitable occasion and to guide us in the footsteps of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين ما شاء الله ما شاء الله جزاك الله خير شيخ مجدي الحمد لله we've reached the uh, unfortunately we've reached the end of the discussion tonight I know some of your tummies are rumbling but ما شاء الله we have certain some cuisine uh, ready الحمد لله but before that there's two more things on our agenda tonight, inshallah. The first one is uh, we have, alhamdulillah, uh, some of our young brothers from uh, ICMG, mashallah, which is the Dandenong Amir Sultan Masjid, mashallah. They've, um, they've got a nasheed group called the Ushaq al Rasul, which is the lovers of the Prophet. And their goal is to share. And spread the love of the Prophet ﷺ and create a halal platform of halal entertainment and bring back the forgotten sunnah of the forgotten poetry that were recited back at the time of the Messenger of Allah. 
So I'd like to call this group, which consists of three young boys, mashallah. Um, Samir, <clears throat> so these three boys, mashallah, is Muazzam Abbas, Samir Daknash, and Safwan Lamlan, mashallah, two uh, graduates of Manhira, and one is still there graduating, inshallah, next year. So I'd like to make a noteworthy uh, mention of that. So without further ado, inshallah, we'll hand the stage for them, inshallah, and then we'll conclude with a dua by our respected Sheikh, Dr. Iftikhar, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd just like to take this opportunity, inshallah, before we start, to thank the Sheikh Dawood and to thank uh, Alit Khan for hosting us as well, inshallah, tonight. Um, as this is obviously another way that we share the story of the Prophet وسلم, and spread his love, inshallah. وسلم. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Brother Sami, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله عدد كمال الله وكما يليق بكمال اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على أسعدنا محمد وعلى آله عدد كمال الله وكما يليق بكمال اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نور الهدى محمد وعلى آله عدد كمال الله وكما يليق بكمال محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى وجد لا يدريه الله
أو أخفي وملك رسول الله صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ومدحت بطيبة طه ودعوت بطه الله ومدحت بطيبة طه ودعوت بطه الله أن يحشرني أوى بلوء رسول الله صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم قال عال بدر علينا من ثانيات الوداع
أنت باب الله معتمد فبدنيا يا يا رسول الله خذ بيدي يا ابن عبد الله يا املي يا ملاذ الخائف الخائف الوجل نظرة يا اكرام الرسل وبغوث حل لحل العقد يا إمام الرسل يا سندي أنت باب الله معتمد فبدنيا يا قسما بالنجم حين هوى ما المعافى والساق والتظيم سوى قسما بالنجم حين هوى ما المعافى والساق والتظيم سوى فاخلع الكونين عنك سوى حب مولى العرب والعجم يا إمام الرسل يا سندي أنت باب الله معتمد فبدنيا يا Mashallah, mashallah, but beautiful, powerful voices. Even the microphone system couldn't handle it. Mashallah, mashallah. You know what's beautiful to see is, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, especially when we're trying to make hijrah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're trying to be serious about our deen, sometimes we forget that we are human. And sometimes it's not all about being too serious. Sometimes we need to smile. Huh? Sometimes actually we should be always smiling, actually, as Muslims. But also, entertainment, having light, humor, having time. These are the times that we should cherish. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our youth as great examples and also inspire our youth in the future to also come up with more, inshallah, of these beautiful, beautiful uh, initiatives. May Allah bless you all. Inshallah, we will conclude our program with a dua by Sheikh Dr. Iftikhar, inshallah. Um, that one is. As long as you want, Sheikh. As long as you want. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Although Sheikh has ordered me for dua, but we have a saying in Persian language. We say that Mullah an bashad ki chup nashawad. Mullah, the Imam is the person who should not keep silent. So whenever you provide the mic to Imam, then he has to say something. <laughs> so before dua, I will mention just only two short stories, which has linkage to Hijra and migration. Uh, sorry for taking time, but I will take few minutes, inshallah. Uh, one of the stories relates to one of the Sahaba. He was living in the time and period of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was living in Mecca, but he loved a lady who migrated in Medina al Munawwara. She was living in Medina. He sent someone asking her hand for marriage purpose. 
She said, I cannot get married to you because you are not a magnet, you are not muhajir. At that time, everyone was looking with very much respect and value to those people who has migrated to Medina. But if someone was sitting beside that he is Muslim and believer, but he is remaining in Mecca, and although he has opportunity to migrate and he is not migrating, so people were looking to him like different views. That lady told him, I cannot get married to you because you did not migrate to Medina. So that Sahabi said, that's easy, no problem, I will come to Medina and migrate, then we will get married. So that Sahabi left Mecca and went to Medina and got married to that lady. From that day, everyone was calling that Sahabi, that man, Muhajiru Umm Qais, the person who migrated in regard to Umm Qais, to get married to Umm Qais. Umm Qais was the name of that lady. Because the Sahaba, who migrated, they were affording all the sacrifices. He was spending his wealth in the sake of Allah. He was affording all the trouble, 500 kilometers by walking. He was sacrificing by her life, everything. He was affording just to get the reward of Hijrah. But this Sahabi migrated only to get married to that lady, Sahabiya. Therefore, he lost all those rewards. In that case, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَتْ حِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ حِجْرَتُهُ لِلدُّنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَجْرَ إِلَيْهِ أو كما قال عليه السلام The reward of each deed in each action is related to your niya intention. If your intention for doing any action is sake of Allah and getting reward of Allah, then you will get the reward for that. But if your intention is not getting reward from Allah, you are migrating to get married to a lady or migrating to do a business or migrating to have a comfortable life, then you will achieve whatever you are, you have that intention. So you will be like far from reward. Therefore, brothers, now we are alhamdulillah in Australia and this is a good opportunity for us to make and change our intentions. If someone has not yet changed his intention to goodness, that he should be a good Muslim here, he should preach for Islam, he should represent Islam in the right way, and she, he should be the messenger of Islam in this country, then we will be like Muhajir Umm Qais. You will have afford all the troubles, but you will not get those rewards. The second short story is that <clears throat> that is also narrated in one of a hadith. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions that there was a person in the ummas before Islam. He killed 99 persons, 99 people. Finally, he was looking for some wise person to seek his advice if he can repent to Allah, make tawbah, ask forgiveness from Allah will there be possibility for that or not? So we, he went to one person, to an imam or scholar or something, and told him that I have killed 99 persons, peoples, and now I would like to repent to Allah. Will that be okay with me? Can I do that? He said, oh, you have killed 99 people, then you are going to repent to Allah? That's impossible. Allah will never accept you. He said, okay, if Allah is not accepting me, you will be the hundred one. So he killed them as well. So he completed hundred people. Then he started thinking again that I can find someone else who can guide me to the right way. Then he went to a wise person and real alim and scholar and told him that I have killed 100 people. Now I would like to repent to Allah and ask his forgiveness. Can you guide me? What should I do? He said, yes, Allah will accept your tawbah. Allah will forgive you and repent to Allah with clear heart. But my advice is that leave the place where you are living now because this place is for bad people. Disobedient people live in that area where you are and they encourage you for these, doing these bad sins. So migrate to that person, the obedient and the pious people live there, live with them and worship Allah there. Therefore nowadays also, if we are looking to our surroundings, sometimes we are listening complaints from parents that my son is doing this and that, my daughter this and that, my family this and that, my society this and that. But we are not looking to real surroundings where I live, all those pious people are not. Therefore, one of the conditions for living of Muslim in such countries is that to live with Muslims. 
to the society where you can find masjid easily, you can find Muslim neighbors, you can find Muslim society, you can find halal food, you can find this and that. So all the opportunity will be available for you, you will not face those troubles. So this is a kind of hijrah also to migrate from the bad people to the right people beside that. And also before dua, I have one glad tidings from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the hadith is mentioned, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that any group of the people that assemble in one of the houses of Allah, and they are remembering Allah, they are teaching the Islamic knowledge, and they are learning Islamic knowledge, four things will happen to them. The first thing is that the tranquility will descend upon them. The second thing, mercy will gulf them. And the third thing, angels will surround them. And the fourth thing is that Allah will make mention of them with the angels and malaika. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mercy upon us in this merciful night and mention us with the angels and malaika. We would like to raise our hands and make dua. <coughs> La ilaha illallah al-halim al-kareem. Subhanallah rabbil arsh al-azim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Nas'aluka mujibat rahmatik wa aza'ima maghfiratik wa al-ismat min kulli dhamb. والغنيمة من كل بر والسلامة من كل إثم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا حاجة هي لك رضا إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك عنه نبيك وحبيبك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذ بك منه نبيك وحبيبك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم عليه